Hi friends, Apostle Price here. This year, we are celebrating 35 years of ever-increasing faith television. We are still walking by faith. During this year, we will air some of our most popular classic series from years gone by. Remember, you have made it happen for the past 35 years. I appreciate your loyalty. Stay with us and enjoy my classic teachings. Get involved. Visit faithdome.org for more details. From Los Angeles, California, ever-increasing faith with pastor and teacher, Dr. Frederick K.C. Price. Welcome to Ever Increasing Faith. Remember these words from the book of Romans, chapter 10, verse 17. So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Well, praise God for another day, and for another privilege and opportunity to share with you the living word of God. Let's turn to the book of Hebrews, chapter 13. Hebrews, chapter 13. Last time we began a new series a series on a subject that I believe is very relevant and timely, and that is the Christian family. And we're talking about the Christian family and all that is involved therein. Therefore, in this series, we will be talking about things that are pertinent to the family relationship, husbands and wives, parents and children, children and parents, etc. We'll be talking about interpersonal things because out of the crucible of my experience as a minister of the gospel and having to deal with people on a one-to-one -one basis relative to marital problems and premarital situations and uh, postmarital things, you come across all kinds of things and it's very evident that people have very distorted and very limited views and understanding of what the Christian family should really be all about. And the reason I say the Christian family is because that's the ultimate family. That's where God is really working. He is in the world and is involved in the lives of men, but he's involved in their lives through the church, the body of Christ. And therefore, the family is the one single strongest unit that God has instituted. He began the family, and it is through the family that things work to their very best. And so we want to talk about the Christian family. And as I said last time, I read a couple of letters that were indicative of the views that people have about talking about, for instance, sexual things publicly, and especially for uh, the church or the minister to talk about them. Now, it's all right if Dr. Ruth talks about them. Uh, it's, it's all right if uh, the devil tells us about sexual things, and really that's exactly what has happened. The devil has been controlling the sexual attitudes of the body of Christ for years because the church has not dealt with it and for whatever reason will not deal with it. So then you're left to learn it in back alleys or locker rooms or the shower room or some little bits and pieces that are so distorted or from some porno movie or magazine or book and so because we don't have any clearly defined teaching from the standpoint of the Word of God, then that's how we're left to learn sexual things. Amen. 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 And if most of, you, most of you will admit it, most of the things that you know about sex, you brought into your, your marriage relationship from the world's point of view. Amen. And so we want to deal with that. And, and I'm going to be frank with you, as I pointed out before, and you know, to some, you know, the old saying, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. What's beautiful to one person is ugly to somebody else. So the point is that what may be gross to you might not be gross to me. You know, what may be something that shouldn't be talked about as far as you're concerned. Well, I have as much right as you do to have my opinion as you do. And since I'm the one on TV and you're the one looking, I'm in control. <laughs> of what I say, but you're in control of what you hear. 
And that TV has a little button on it that says off and on. And if that doesn't work, you can always pull the plug out of the wall. Amen. But I'm going to be dealing with it and I'm going to be talking down on a level as I usually do, right where people live, right where we live on a daily basis. I want you to understand what I'm talking about. I'm not going to attempt for any sensational reason to be gross or try to be vulgar. I don't consider it vulgar. I don't think that the truth is vulgar Amen. myself. Amen. Now, if you're, if you're prudish and you have a problem with sexual things being discussed openly and publicly, and especially many of you because we get letters, I get personal letters from children all the time who listen to the broadcast and understand exactly what they hear because it's down on a level where everybody can understand it. And yet, I, and yet it may be that you as a parent, you're not ready for your kids to hear this, especially from somebody else. You'd rather tell them yourself, first of all. Or maybe you don't want them to hear it because you know once they hear what I'm going to say, they're going to understand it and they're going to start asking you questions that you don't have any answers for, and that's embarrassing. So to cover that up, you try to shoot me down and tell me I shouldn't talk about certain things. Because of your inadequacies and inability to deal with your kids on these subjects. But if you don't want them to hear this, then I'm telling you now in front, switch off. Or switch over to something else and just jump back on at the time that the program first comes on and let me announce the subject. And that way you'll know whether I'm still on the subject of the Christian family. And so if you can't handle it, then there won't be a problem. But I tell you right now, don't waste your letters and don't waste our valuable time telling me how I ought to minister on television. Okay? You didn't assign me my task. You're not paying my wages. And you're not going to be my judge. Hallelujah. Oh, glory. So if you're not ready for this, then the best thing to do is don't look on. Because him that hath ears to hear will hear. And I'm only talking to them that have ears to hear. The rest of you that don't have ears to hear, then I'm not even talking to you, okay? So I wanted to say that, and I'm going to say this each time I begin because I want you to understand. Of course, if you switch on in the middle of the program, that's your problem, not mine. You should have been there when it started. Amen. You should be everywhere where it starts. You shouldn't be coming in on after the train is left, you running down the track. Wait for me, wait for me. They're going to leave you at the station. <laughs> Amen. So I just wanted to, to mention that because I don't want a lot of confusion. So that's what I'll be saying each time, try to make it as brief as I can, but at the same time deal with it. Now, the Christian family. The first thing that we started out dealing with and I didn't finish up on, and that is marriage, a divine ordinance. The first thing that I want to establish is the fact that marriage is ordained of God. Not that you marry her or she marry you as individual personalities, but that marriage itself is ordained and therefore sanctioned by God. And any female, male, interpersonal relationship intimately outside of the marriage situation is taboo. It is not ordained of God. It is not sanctioned by God. And therefore, it is not blessed by God. So what I wanted to do is take the Bible and establish for you the fact that or marriage is husbands and wives are ordained of God, that God instituted the family, not the devil. The devil has perverted it and attempted to destroy it, but he did not originate it, God did. Now, last time we were talking about Hebrews chapter 13. Now, these verses that we were, have been reading and that we will read for the next few moments are designed to simply show you that husband wife, marriage, are ordained of God. That's the whole purpose of it, all right? Now, in Hebrews 13 and verse 4, it says, Marriage is honorable in all, and the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. Well, the very first word helps us to establish our premise, and that is that marriage is ordained of God. It says marriage. It didn't say shacking up is ordained of God. It didn't say common law is ordained of God. It didn't say uh, living like you're married is ordained of God. It says marriage is. So if marriage is ordained of God, then the opposite of marriage would be living in a relationship that looks like marriage, participating in all of the things that married people participate in without marriage, then therefore that means that it is not honorable. 
If marriage is honorable, the opposite of marriage must be dishonorable. Hmm. Okay? All right. Marriage is honorable in all. And the bed undefiled. That is, the marriage bed is undefiled. And again, as I was saying before we closed last time, the word, the marriage bed is undefiled, does not mean that that gives you license to try all of your exotic, pornographic tricks on your husband and wife. Some people, Christians, want to use the excuse, well, the marriage bed is honorable, so that means we can do whatever we want to do. No, it doesn't. It just simply means that the marriage bed is honorable. And that's the bed on which you should be intimately involved with your spouse. Out because of the outcropping of marriage. See, marriage is honorable in all and the bed undefiled. See, notice that the bed comes after the marriage. <laughs> huh? Yeah. Hallelujah. <laughs> Glory to God. Hallelujah. Yeah, you notice that, that the marriage comes before the bed? No marriage, no bed. Okay? All right. Now, he says marriage is honorable in all, and the bed undefiled. That is, the marriage bed is undefiled. That is not a license for you to try all your exotic tricks, as, as I've said before. It just simply means that it's, it's undefiled. Therefore, you can be involved in an intimate personal relationship with your spouse, and God sanctions that. But he doesn't sanction perversion. I said he doesn't sanction perversion. And anything outside the natural use is a perversion. Huh? Are you following me? All right. Let's turn to 1 Timothy now. And look at another verse. 1 Timothy, the third chapter. Again, all I'm doing at this point is establishing the fact that marriage is ordained of God. That husbands and wives, that's God's method of relationship. Now, understand this too, that when I say this, that doesn't mean that every single person has to get married. I don't mean to indicate that. You can live unmarried if you want to. That's a choice that you make. But if you live as an unmarried person, then you can't participate in marriage activities. You can't and be in the will and grace of God. I mean, you can do it. It's obvious you can do it because folk are doing it every minute. I mean, right now while we're having this service, somebody's doing, you know, what married folk do and they're not married to each other. So, I mean, as far as physically being able to do it, yes, you can do it, but you don't do it with the love and sanctions of God. You don't do it with the grace of God or with the approval of God. And you don't have to get married. I mean, you can be, live a celibate life if you want to and never marry. That's fine. But then you can't participate in marriage activities if you're not married. Not and have God bless it. That's the point. Okay? So understand that. I'm not telling everybody you have to get married. If you don't choose to get married, that's on you. You don't have to if you don't want to. Stay single all your life. It's, I have no problem with it. It doesn't affect me in the least. I don't mind at all. But if you are unmarried, then you do what unmarried folk do. You don't do what married folk do. If you want to do what married folk do, then you do get married. <laughs> and then you can do what married folk do. Okay? All right. 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 12. It says, let the deacons be the what? Of, of one what? Wow. Ruling their children and their own house as well. Now, the only, deal, the only part that I'm dealing with here is not the deacons. We're not discussing deacons. But I just want you to see the word husband and wife. That's all. To let you know that this is ordained of God. All right? We're not dealing with whether the deacon should have one wife or nine wives. I, I'm not discussing that right now. But it says, let the deacons be the husbands of one wife. So what I'm dealing with is husband and wife to show you that those words are words ordained of God and husband and wife imply marriage. Mm -hmm. is, that, is that correct? Amen. See, the word husband and wife implies married. That's, that's the point that I want you to see. Now, while you're right there on that page, flip over to the fifth chapter of 1 Timothy and look at the 14th verse. It says, I will therefore that the younger women live singly and bear children. 
Well, that's the way some folk must be interpreting it. Huh? I mean, they're slaughtering and butchering about a million babies, a million babies a year. So that that's what they must mean. Young women have babies. Not be married, not get married, but just have children. Well, that doesn't say that, does it? It says, I will therefore that the younger women, what? Marry. Okay, to get married, bear children, guide the house, give non-occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully. Again, the only part that I'm dealing with at this time, we'll come back to this verse later on in the series, as it applies to another facet of the Christian family. Right now, I'm simply establishing the fact that marriage is the will of God. See, that's God's order. And that God wants us to see that it is in the marriage relationship that the husband and wife activities should be carried out. And so when he says here, I will therefore that the younger women marry, the word marry implies, marriage implies, husband implies, wife implies, home or family. That's the point that I wanted you to see. All right, do you have the picture now? I think that I've given you sufficient biblical evidence to support the contention that marriage is ordained of God. And that is God's will for man and woman intimate, ultimate relationship is in the context of marriage. Now I want to move on to another aspect of the Christian family. And this is a very touchy area and yet a very needed area to be discussed and to be discussed uh, publicly. And that is the area of marriage, divorce, and the obligation of it. In other words, am I obligated, I'm married, am I obligated to stay with my wife? Do I have to stay with my husband? Regardless. He beats up on me every Saturday night when he comes in from his drunken stupor. He abuses the children. This has been going on for 10 years. According to the Bible, do I have to stay married? The obligation. Can I divorce? Is there room for divorce? Is divorce wrong? Is divorce against the will of God? Now, before I start dealing with this, let me preface it by saying this. We're going to read some scriptures in just a few moments. And give me credit for being at least as literate as you are. And that is that I can read like you can. And I know that there are certain scriptures that we can read in the Bible that appear to be cut and dried. I mean, it appears to be that you marry if you get a divorce for any other reason than because of fornication involved in it. And you get married to somebody else, you're committing adultery. Now, I can, I, I can read, okay? And so I don't want to argue with you uh, about it. You don't need to go through the Bible and get all the scriptures on divorce to try to teach Fred about divorce. I've already read them all. I researched them very thoroughly in order to uh, bring forth this series. So you can just save your, yourself a lot of time. All I'm going to do is present to you what I call another view. The ultimate decision about any of this that I'm going to talk about will be up to you. And whatever decision you make, I have no problem with it. I have no problem. If, if, you, if you believe, I was talking to a man one time, a man and a woman contemplating marriage. The woman was the person that set up the appointment because she was having some difficulty with this man in terms of some of the things that he was thinking about. The thing is that he had been married before and he had been in a church where he had been taught that if you marry and you get a divorce, that you cannot marry another person. Now, if the divorce was not because of the cause of fornication, then you cannot get married again until your spouse dies. So he believed that he couldn't get married as long as his former wife was still alive. Well, this girl was, that he was with now was all torn up because she wanted, they, she wanted to get married. But he didn't want to get married because he didn't feel like it was so. Now, I don't usually like it like he should because his former wife was still alive. And, and I don't usually get involved with people. Sometimes I want to tell folk what to do, but I, that's not really my place to tell you what to do. You, all I can do is tell you, here are the options based on the word of God. You have to make the final decision because just as sure as I tell you what to do, you're going to blame me for it. <laughs> if it don't work, you're going to want to sue me. And I don't need that. So I don't ever tell basically somebody, you ought to do this. I simply say, now here's what the Word of God says. Here, here are the, here's several options that are open to you. Now you've got to pray and be led of the Spirit as to what's going to work best for you. That's, that's all I can do. I'm not going to, even though I want to tell you, divorce that monster. <laughs> Hit him in the head with a lead pipe. 
set his bed on fire. <laughs> Put some arsenic in his eggs. Oh, I'm, I'm not kidding you. I mean, that's what I'd like to tell somebody. I, I'd like to tell him that. But I dare not say that, see. Because if I do, you go and you'll be standing up in court. Pastor Price told me to kill my husband. <laughs> Reverend Price told me to beat my husband. That's why I did it with that lead pipe. Reverend Price told me to do that. No. But that I, I, want, I, I told this girl, I said, why in the world? Would you want to force this man to marry you when he's already told you that he believes that he cannot in faith and in stay in the grace of God marry you while his former wife is still alive? Why would you want to marry that man in the first place? And put yourself through all this heartache, all these tears, all this crying, all this mess you're going through. You're frustrated, you're uptight, you've been out of shape, and the man already told you <laughs> that as long as my former wife is alive, I don't believe it's right for me to marry. Why in the world would you want to marry somebody like that? So there are all kinds of attitude. I'm not going to deal with any of those. I, I'm not going to tell you what to do. But I want to show you another view because I believe there is another view. I believe God showed me something back in 1979. I've never heard anybody mention it. I've never heard anybody else mention it. But I want to present it to you as an alternative. The ultimate decision is going to be yours. I can read. And there are some scriptures that we're going to read in a few moments, and when you read them, it looks like that's it. I mean, it's cut and dry. There, there are no options. There are no outs. There's no exception. I mean, that's it. You don't have any choice. It's either that way or you out of the will of God. Okay? But I want to show you something that I believe will help you to see what God's ultimate intent is. What his ultimate intent is. What his bottom line purpose really is. So the point is that when I broach my subject to you, and begin to deal with it, you may disagree. Fine, let's just stay in love in Jesus. Don't fall out. I, I'm, I, I'll guarantee you that if you'll just keep listening, that in this hour we spend together, there'll be at least one little tidbit that you can gain that will help you in your life. You don't have to agree with the other 99%. Just take, but take the one. At least that's beneficial to you if you get just one little point out of it that you can use. You know what I mean? But don't, don't get mad about it and don't write me a bunch of letters with a whole lot of scriptures trying to show me that I ought to stay with my wife no matter what she does to me or she ought to stay with me no matter what I do to her. I already know that. And if you feel that way, all you have to do is to, to, to live that way. I was in uh, North Carolina <clears throat> uh, in the year 1985. And I was teaching um, in a seminar and I... I had a question and answer session at one of the sessions that I had, and rather than just teach outrightly, I had this question and answer because I know that a lot of times in teaching you raise a lot of questions and, and people, you know, they hear you and they think about a question, but they never get a chance to ask specifically about that thing. So I like to, you know, give questions and answers. I'm not, never intimidated by questions because if I don't know the answer, I just tell you, I don't know. Next question, please. <laughs> See, some people get all upset. Well, suppose I, they ask something I can't answer. So the best thing to do, don't have a question and answer because if I get a question I can't answer, then I'm going to look dumb if I can't answer. No, I'm not. I'm just going to tell you, I don't know. Next question, please. Amen. That's it. Amen. I never said I knew everything. So anyway, this lady had heard... Um, I think had purchased the tapes of this series. I've only done this once. In the year 1979 is the only time I ever taught on the Christian family as such. And uh, boy, I mean, when I, when I gave opportunity for the people to ask their questions, she was up like a bolt of lightning. I mean, she was ready for Freddie. <laughs> and I mean to tell you, that lady lit into me. I mean, she just took her teeth and she just clawed me. And her, her fingers, she just clawed me. She just went, ah! I mean, she laid it out. And I mean, she got up there, ah, 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 ah. You know how you ladies, you, you know how you, you know how you big mouth sisters can do. <laughs> boy, I mean, she laid into me, boy. I mean, she turned me every way but loose. And uh, because of this, this other view. And she wanted to tell me what well, the Bible said this and the Bible said that and the Bible said the other. And, and, and you said this and so on and forth. And then when she got all finished with that, boy, she just sat back and folded her arms. She said, I got him now. You know, that's what she, her attitude, I got it, what's he going to do now? And I told her, I said, look, sister, I said, if you, you read those scriptures and you said that, that, that Jesus said that if you get a divorce for any other reason other than fornication, that you can't marry again 
without it being adultery on your part. I said, your best option is to go with that. Next question. <laughs> what else could I say? I wasn't going to argue with her. It's up to She can do whatever she wants. All I told her, I said, my, this, this other view, this is my best shot on it. See? This, this, I believe God gave me that revelation to help people. See, think about this. I'm married now to the same woman for 32 years. Now, the point I'm making, and don't write me about me bragging about how long I've been married. You, you would be surprised at the letters I get on stuff I say. <laughs> Poor things. Bless, bless their heart. I'm just trying to help folk. I don't have to tell anybody any of my business. But the point I want to make is this. That as I talk about divorce, it's not to cover my tracks. I've been married to the same person. See, if I was trying to find another view, then it might be that I'm trying to exonerate myself because I have been married before, and now to justify me being divorced and married again as a minister of the gospel, I'm coming up with this new teaching that will help to exonerate me. I don't need it. I'm still married to the same person for 32 years, so I don't need to come up with another view. And don't ever plan to get a divorce. So I don't need another view. It's not for my benefit to cover my tracks and make me look good. I want to help people because I know that half of the population is divorced. Half of the marriages end up in divorce, if not more. And that is a horrendous, sad, pitiful, unacceptable ratio. And the reason for it is, is out of ignorance of what's going on in the things of God. And people are all messed up. And so this other view is only to help, okay? So you don't have to accept it. And after I say it, if you don't agree with it, let's just stay in love in Jesus. And you go on being lonely the rest of your life and staying unmarried and trying to raise them four kids without a husband. And I have no problem with that. And I'm not trying to be sarcastic or funny. What else can I tell you? If you disagree with me, what in the world else can I do about that? Absolutely nothing. But I'm not going to argue about it. You want to argue? You argue with yourself. But don't write me some old ignorant letter. I'm like, I disagree. If you disagree, just disagree. I disagree with a whole lot of stuff that's going on. I'm not going to write anybody no letter about nothing. I'm just not going to watch your program no more. I ain't going to read your book no more. And I don't want to see you no more. Huh? I'm not going to write no letter. Waste a, a stamp, my good stamp on you, I just cut you off. And you have that privilege. All right, here we go. Are you ready? Yes. All right, turn to Genesis chapter 2. Now, we read this verse that we're going to read. We read it initially in establishing our premise that marriage is ordained of God. But I want to read it again as a touchstone for what we're going to be talking about now, and that is marriage, divorce, the obligation of it. You know, am I obligated to stay with my husband, to stay with my wife, regardless of how he treats me or what he does to me? Is that what God's intent is? I'm a Christian. I'm born again, filled with the Spirit. My husband is an atheist. He doesn't believe in God. He beats me. He abuses the children. He's been doing this for seven years. Is it the will of God that I stay in that situation? And perhaps in one of his drunken stupors, perhaps not meaning to do it, he hits me in a way that kills me. Could that be the will of God? See, and, and this is what some churches leave the people with. That that's it. You've got to stay there. Well, that's fine if that's what God says. Then we don't have any choice about it. But I'm very thoroughly convinced that that's not God's will. Amen. That that's not his intent. Amen. Even though there are some things that are stated here that we're going to read in just a few moments that's, that almost at face value seem like there is no other out. If you follow me through on the whole thing, I believe that I can show you in panoramic view another view. That will give you an option and I think will help you to see some things that perhaps, perhaps haven't been seen before or certainly never broached publicly. All right. Genesis 2 verse 24. It says, Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be what? One, One flesh. All right. Again, that certainly speaks to the idea that God wants people to get together. And that's his ultimate plan, his purpose, and it is consistent with his perfect will. Now, let's look at Matthew chapter 5. 
Matthew's Gospel, chapter 5. Now, first of all, let me say again, I'm going to read several scriptures. And then, in the final analysis, I will give explanation on it. As we read the scriptures, I might touch on some things as explanation, but it won't be fully explained until I get to the very end. But I have to present all of the facts of the case. See what I mean? And so I've got to go through these things in a, on a piecemeal basis. A little here, a little there, a little there. And then finally, once I present all the facts to you, then I'll explain what I believe the intent of God is. And then you'll have a whole panorama to look at and make a judgment about. Okay? All right. Now, Matthew chapter 5, we want to look at verse 31 and 32. Jesus is speaking. It says, It hath been said, Whosoever shall put away his wife, let him give her a writing of divorcement. But I say unto you that whosoever shall put away his wife, saving, which means except, for the cause of fornication, causeth her to commit adultery. And whosoever shall marry her that is divorced, committeth adultery. Now that's, you know, that's about a pla as plain as the nose on your face. And if you take this exactly for what it says, then you don't have any out. You have no option. There's no way out for you. I mean, it's, it's cut and dry. If you, if you get a divorce for other than the cause of fornication, that means sexual intercourse with somebody else you're not married to while you're married to someone else. Fornication. Then if you divorce and marry somebody else, for, for fornication, you're safe. You can do that. But if it's not for fornication, just because of incompatibility, you just can't get along because you won't get along. That's the only reason people don't get along is because they won't. They can. Just like they can disagree, they can agree. They just don't choose to agree. That's why they don't get along. So they, just, they finally get so frustrated with each other that they, they, they go into court and they settle the thing on incompatibility. Or mental cruelty or all the other games that people play. So you get a divorce, now you're free to go out, you go out and marry somebody else. According to this statement, if you do that, you're committing adultery. You're living in adultery. So really what it means then, that if you got married, uh, got a divorce for other than the fornication and you've been divorced, you can't get married again. You have to stay single the rest of your life. That's what this appears to say. And yet at the very same time that it says that, I want to ask this question. To those that want to hold to the letter of this, and there are churches and denominations that hold to it, they wouldn't change to save their lives. I mean, that's it. It's cut and dried. They won't accept you can't hold an office in the church. You can't be a minister or pastor in that church. You are doomed. That's it. You have to stay single the rest of your life. Because that's what they say this means. All right, now, if they just use a little deductive reasoning, if, if, if the will of God is that you get married and stay married to that person that you're married to, Regardless of what happens, you stay married, that that's the will of God and anything other than that would be uh, outside the will of God. Then if that be true, God could never give any exception to the rule. And he gave an exception right there. When he said except for the cause, he said except for the cause or saving, which literally means except for the cause of fornication. So that's an, that, that, that is an exception. Therefore, apparently then it must not be that God must not be that hot to trot. To make that thing stick where you got to get married and that's it, sink or swim, do or die, you got to stay right there with it no matter what it is. Because if so, he could never give you any kind of out under any circumstance. If his ultimate will is to stay together without a divorce, under any circumstance, then he can't tell you except for the cause of fornication. That's an exception. Now let me show you an illustration and you'll be able to see this. Have you ever heard this statement before? Except a man be born again... He cannot see the kingdom of God. Do you know that there is no alternative to that in the Bible? Do you know that there is no exception to that rule? Do you know that God doesn't say, Now, nah, child, I understand the situation. You were born in an atheist home. You weren't responsible for that. Your mother and father were both atheists. You had no, no exposure to spiritual things or Christian virtues. And so because you lived your whole life within that framework of that family situation, I'm going to go ahead and save you and let you into heaven anyway because I know that it wasn't really your fault. Honey, there are no exceptions. 
neither is there salvation in any other, for there's none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Jesus said to the man Nicodemus, and he didn't say it optionally, he said this, it was an imperative necessity, he said, except a man be born again, he cannot. He said, ye must be born again. He didn't say you may be, or you could be, he said you must be. M-U-S-T is an imperative necessity. It means you don't have a, thank you, thank you, I was just getting ready to move. Uh, it, it, it means that you have no, there, there's no exception. You must be born again. If you're not born again, you can't. You cannot enter into the kingdom of God. There's nowhere in the Bible where you find any exception to that rule. Now, I'm saying this, that if marriage is like salvation to God, then there would never anywhere be any exemption from that. So the thing that it says to me is that God will accept no, that's not his best. I mean, it's not God's best that two people that were married, one of them went off and committed sexual intercourse with somebody they weren't married to. I'm sure that wasn't God's will. That sure wasn't God's best. Huh? I'm sure he would have rather that you had not done that, right? All right, Matthew, uh, Mark chapter 10. Mark the 10th chapter. All right, beginning with verse 2. It says, Then the Pharisees came to him and asked him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife? tempting him. And he answered and said unto them, What did Moses command you? And they said, Moses suffered or permitted to write a bill of divorcement and to put her away. And Jesus answered and said unto them, For the hardness of your heart, he wrote you this precept. But from the beginning of the creation of God made them male and female. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife and they twain or two shall be one flesh. So then they are no more twain or two but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together let no man put asunder. And in the house his disciples asked him again of the same matter. And he said unto them whosoever shall put away his wife and marry another committeth adultery against her. And if a woman shall put away her husband and be married to another, she committeth adultery. Man, I mean to tell you that the man don't leave no op option, does he? I mean, that's, that's cut and dried, isn't it? But, it? but is that what he means? What, what does he mean? Is that, what he's, is, is that what he's saying? If he is saying that, then again, I submit to you that he's saying that you as a child of God may be having gotten saved after you married this man who wasn't a Christian, now you are, and he isn't, but he beats you, he uh, molests your children, treats you like a dog, and yet you've been redeemed from the curse of the law. You're filled with the Holy Spirit, and God is saying to you, knuckle under to the devil. Yeah, let the devil spit on you, let the devil uh, torture you, let the devil abuse you, let the devil beat up on you, let the devil abuse your children, because after all, you're married and you have to stay married come hell or high water as they say out on the street. That's what it looks like he's saying. Well, you know, it doesn't seem reasonable, but you know, we don't, we don't submit God's word to reason. We have to bring reason up to the level of the word of God. And even though it doesn't seem reasonable, yet if it, if it is the will of God, we got to go with it. Even if it seems unreasonable, we'll have to go with it. If it's the word of God. But is it? That's the question that we have to, to decide. Now listen to this again. Verse 11 and 12. And he saith unto them, Whosoever shall put away his wife and marry another committeth adultery against her. And if a woman shall put away her husband and be married to another, she committeth adultery. Whew. If that be true, there are a whole lot of you folks that are living in adultery right now. Huh? Amen. Because some of you have been married more than once. If this holds true, then you're in adultery. Now, I cannot believe that God will sanction adultery. And I cannot believe that God will bless adultery. Because if God blesses adultery, then he confirms you in that adultery. He, as they say in the legal profession or in police parlance, God would be aiding and abetting the crime. Huh? And he would be held as an accessory after the fact. Huh? So if God, if I'm living in adultery, then God, if he blesses what we do, my wife and I, she and I, if, if he blesses that, that seems like it would be saying to me, God must approve of our relationship. God must approve of our union. And that would further confirm me or confirm us in the union. It would be to God's advantage to get me back on track 
to let me be cursed in everything I do in that relationship. And maybe I'd finally wake up and find out, hey, I'm in the, out of the will of God. This, this relationship is not right. I got to get back to where I was in the first place and go back and redeem the time. Are you following me? And yet I know people. I know people who came to the ministry and came under the influence of the word of God. Their lives were a wreck going somewhere to happen. And they have gotten married within the confines of the word of God and the spirit of God. And their relationship is a beautiful rose sending up a sweet smell in the nostrils of God. And they're being blessed and they are a blessing to other people. I cannot believe that that's the devil blessing that relationship. I can't believe that Satan is blessing that relationship. As dumb as he is, he's not that dumb to bless you and then you keep on giving Jesus the credit for it. And giving God the glory. He is not that dumb. As dumb as he is, he's not that dumb. Okay, keep that in mind. So there, 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 there has to be something going on here. What, what does this all really mean? What's the bottom line? All right, we have to look at another scripture. Um, <clears throat> let's look at John chapter 10 for a moment. This is a very familiar verse of scripture, but I want to use it to illustrate a truth to help focus your attention along the lines that we're dealing with. John chapter 10. All right, the 10th verse, Jesus is speaking. He said, the thief cometh not but to steal and to kill, cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they may have it more abundantly. Well, abundant life cannot be you trying to raise three kids without a husband and having to struggle to be both mother and father, especially in the face of the fact that you have a desire to have companionship legally in the sight of God, to have a husband, to have a father for your children, to have someone to share your dreams, your visions, and your aspirations, to have someone to share life with you, and then God say, what things soever you desire when you pray, believe that you receive them and you shall have them. And if your desire is to have a husband or have a wife or have a family, but because of a situation that you found yourself in and you didn't even really know how you got into it in the first place, it was a botched up situation, no question about it, but you got out of that, now you're ready to go on, you found out about the word of God, about the will of God, and you want to live in such a way that will be pleasing to God and yet bring you that abundant life that Jesus was talking about, according to those scriptures that we've already read, you're stuck. Nothing you can do. You've got to stay lonely the rest of your life. There's no hope for you. If you do, you'll be committing adultery. Is that God's intention? It sure seems like it, based on what the Word says that we've read. That, that's what it looks like. But I keep going back to the fact that there was an exception, wasn't it? I mean, if this thing was, like I said, if God was so hot to trot on this thing, I mean, this is absolutely, you just cannot deviate from this, then he, I don't, why in the world would he give us any, any kind of out? Why would there be any? He doesn't give any out on salvation. <coughs> I mean, you must be born again. That's it. If you're not born again, you're going to hell. That is it. Cut and dried. There's no appeal. There's nothing. That's it. <coughs> Ye must be born again. Except a man be born again, he cannot see. He cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That is it. Why didn't he make an exception? Why didn't he give an exception? That lets me know he ain't playing games with salvation. You either is or you ain't. There is no mister in between. No middle ground. But here he does say, if fornication is involved, then you're free to go and get married. That is an exception. That is an exception. And I believe that God is consistent. Now, let us look at Deuteronomy chapter... 24. And I want to ask you to fasten your seat belts. Especially you that have been coming down on people with a heavy hand. Preachers and ministers of the gospel especially. And, been, and, and leaving people with no out. No way out. People living under condemnation and fear. Fearful, afraid, lonely. Jesus said, I came that you might have life and have it more abundantly. 
Now, my Bible tells me, this is just another point, my Bible tells me that when I come to Christ, if I repent and tell God, forgive me, I'm sorry for my, the sins that I've committed, that God blots out my past life. Well, if I've been married three times in my past life before I came to God, I mean, now he's going he's gonna to forgive me of committing murder. He'll forgive me of lying and cheating, but he won't forgive me for a bad marriage. Wow. <laughs> Deuteronomy chapter 24. It's fasten your seatbelt. And you better put your coffee cup down because I don't want you to ruin that new carpet. Your wife will break your head. <laughs> you, gonna, you may drop your cup. Listen to this now. Chapter 24. When a man, verse 1, when a man hath taken a wife and married her, and it come to pass that she find no favor in his eyes, because he had found some uncleanness or indecency in her. Why didn't he say adultery? Why didn't he say fornication, if that's what he meant? Why didn't he say it? Because he had found some uncleanness in her, that then let him write her a bill of divorcement and give it in her hand and send her out of his house. Put that sister in the street. <laughs> watch, watch, listen, listen. Latter part of the verse. And give it, let him write her a bill of divorcement, and give it in her hand, and send her out of his house. And when she is departed out of his house, she may go and be another man's wife. How can she without being an adulteress? How can he? How dare God tell her that she can go and be another man's wife? That will mean that she's been married twice. Why doesn't he call her an adulteress? Oh, that's nothing. Hold on. Verse 3. Verse 3. And if the latter husband hate her, and write her a bill of divorcement, and give it in her hand, and sendeth her out of his house. Or if the latter husband die, which took her to be his wife, her former husband, which sent her away, may not take her again to be his wife. Now the very fact that it says that he, that first husband, may not take her again to be his wife is indicative of the fact that she could go and be somebody's wife because if she couldn't be anybody's wife, there wouldn't be any need to say the first husband couldn't have her back because she couldn't be the wife of anybody's husband. Couldn't be the wife of anybody's husband, right. Isn't that right? Did I say that right? Yeah. The woman has now married for the third time. And nowhere does it say she's an adulteress. Now has God changed? The Bible says God changes not. God doesn't change. But it looks like what Jesus said and what God is saying over here in Deuteronomy looked like somebody changed. It looks like it. I didn't say they did. I said that's what it looks like. Because Jesus said, what did Moses say? And they said, he said, give her a writing of divorcement and send her away. Jesus said, but I say, except it be for fornication, you cause her to commit adultery. He amplified on it. But now wait a minute. If he amplified on it, the amplification could not be in contradiction to the original idea. It couldn't be a contradiction to it. It could be an expansion of it, but that presupposes that there is another principle involved. There has to be a, a deeper underlying principle for him to have to make this expansion on what God said in the first place. Okay? Now, she's been, she, she got married to the second man, and he divorces her, or he dies. No, she's been married twice now. And it says that she can't be, her, her first husband can't take her back. 
anymore. So that means now that she's married, she could be married the third time. It implies that she could be married the third time. First two times were by divorce. Possible divorce. Husband divorced her. It doesn't say anything about fornication. So it doesn't say it was adultery. I mean, it seems to me like it's an exception. Doesn't it to you? He gave an exception. He said, let, her, let him write her a, a bill of divorcement, send her away. All right, keep that in mind. Keep all these things in mind. And look now mm, at 1 Corinthians chapter 7. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. And we're talking about another view. Now, I'll get to the explanation of all of this, but what I'm doing is laying a groundwork. I want to get these thoughts in your mind so that you'll be thinking about them. And I am well persuaded that when we get to the end of the whole thing, you'll be blessed. Amen. It'll help to set some people free. I'm interested in finding out God's, finding God's best. Um, I'm not interested in trying to find some way to circumvent God's will. I mean, if it's God's will, that's it. I don't have any choice but to go with it. But I want to be sure that that's what God's will is. And, and there are some things that you see, we see, the Bible already told us in 1 Corinthians 13, we see through a glass darkly. We, we still don't see it. Now, there's some things that are, I believe are, are clearer than some other things are, you know, like salvation. Except a man be born again. That's pretty clear. I mean, the, the glass ain't too dark that I'm looking through when I look through to read that. Except a man be born again. I mean, that's telling me there is no other way. But there are some other things where there, there's room here for something else. Now, all we want to do is find out what is the ultimate bottom line that God is trying to get across to us. See? I'm not trying to condone divorce. And I'm not trying to say people need to have to stay together no matter what the situation is. What I'm trying to do is find out what's God's intent in the first place. What is his final goal in all of this? Because, see, I've got to deal... I have to deal not only with the Word of God, that's the first place we deal with, but I still have to deal with life because I see God manifested in life. Yes, I read about God on the pages of the Bible. There are some things that come across or come from the Bible that are principles, that are laws, that they, 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 we take them out and apply them to our lives. But then there's another facet of, of, the, of life where we actually see God moving in the lives of individual people. We see him moving in marriages. We see him moving in community. We see him moving in people's lives. And so therefore we see experiences. Now those experiences cannot be inconsistent with any principle or law that is enunciated in the Bible. They have to agree. Amen. Ultimately they have to agree. God can't tell me one thing in the book and then go do something else in life. That would be contradictory. Are you still here? Yeah. Are you following me? All right. You're thinking, right? All right. Now, what did I tell you? 1 Corinthians chapter 7. All right. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. And I want to begin reading in the 7th chapter of 1 Corinthians. I want to begin reading at verse... Oh, let's start with verse 10. All right, Paul is speaking. First of all, let me ask you this question. How many of you believe that Paul was a saved man? Thank you. How many of you believe that Paul was filled with the Holy Ghost? Thank you. How many of you believe that, that Jesus called Paul to the ministry? Okay. All right, you said it. All right, here we go. 1 Corinthians 7, verse 10. And unto the married I command, yet not I, but the Lord. Let not the wife depart from her husband, but, and if she depart, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband. And let not the husband put away his wife, but to the rest speak I, not the Lord. If any brother hath a wife that believeth not, and she be pleased to dwell with him, let him not put her away. And the woman which hath an husband that believeth not, and if he be pleased to dwell with her, let her not leave him. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Else were your children unclean, or literally unblessed, but now are they holy. But if the unbelieving depart, let him depart. A brother or a sister is not under bondage in such cases. But God hath called us to peace. Now, if that is not an exception, I don't know what it is. 
Here he said, now, if you're married, if you're a Christian and you're married to an unbeliever and the unbeliever leaves you and divorces you, and the implication here is that it wasn't for the cause of fornication, you're free to go ahead and marry somebody else. Isn't that an exception? I said, isn't that an exception? Yes. Well, it's blowing a hole in this, in, this, in this idea that God says, married once, that's it. You got to go with it, good or bad, sweet or sour, sink or swim. You got to stay with it. Not according to this. Look like here's an exception. Now, keep all of this in mind. We're going to, <laughs> we're going to get to the, to the finale here pretty soon. All right, I want you to go back now and look at something else because there's a verse that I want to deal with, Mark chapter 10. Go back to the 10th chapter of Mark, and I want to extract something that we read over. Some of you may have seen it as we read over it, but it's very important. Mark chapter 10. And I want us to look at verse 9. It says, What therefore God hath joined together... Let no man put asunder. And I must asunder out of here because I just ran out of time. But stay right where you are. I'm not finished with this message. If this message has been a blessing to you, the announcer will tell you some very important information about how you may obtain an audio cassette of the message which you have just heard for your own spiritual enrichment and edification. Remember that these telecasts and radio broadcasts are made possible by the continued free will offerings of you, the viewers, and listeners. Remember also these words from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, For we walk by faith, not by sight. This program is now available to you on CD or DVD to share with your family and friends. CD copies are available for your love gift of any amount. DVD copies are available for your love gift of $15 or more for the ongoing support of this ministry. Call the number on your screen or write to Apostle Frederick K.C. Price, Box 90,000, Los Angeles, California, 90009. Indicate the number you see on your screen. Like us on Facebook and Twitter and join us again on the ever-increasing Faith Network, bringing to you the power of...